good to be with you all again and this time of worship that we share in this unique way and continue to do so. And it is uh, really a gift that we can come together this way, a blessing from God that we can share in this worship time together. So hello and welcome to all of you. It's good to be with you. As we gather on this seventh Sunday in the Eastertide uh, season, it's also uh, a Sunday that we recognize as Memorial Sunday, a Memorial Weekend. And I hope you're all having um, as good a time as you can on this Memorial Weekend. I know when I was a kid, it was such a special time. We'd always get together with friends and particularly with family. And I know we're kind of limited in being able to do that now. But I hope that you're celebrating this Memorial Weekend with at least some of those whom you love and care for as we remember. And really, Memorial Sunday is about that, a time to remember those who gave their life for our country in service of our country, and also as an extension of um, memorializing those whom we love. It's a time all, also to stop and think about those who are no longer with us, who have passed on um, and have left a mark with us as family and friends. Uh, I think often of my mom and dad on Memorial Weekend, and many of us continue the tradition of placing flowers on our loved one's grave. So. Memorial Weekend is a time to remember and to reflect, and I think it's also an appropriate time to stop and remember about the gathering of the first church and what that was like and who were those first individuals. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we continue to worship together. But first, I'd like you to join with me in our call to worship, which is, as usual, taken from one of the Psalms. I'll be reading from, let's see, Psalm... I'll be reading from Psalm 68. If you'd like to join with me, the invitation is always open that you share with me in the scripture readings. And I'll be reading from Psalm 68, beginning with verses, let's see, verses 1 through 10. Excuse me here, lost my place. Psalm 68, 1 through 10. And then I'm going to jump over to, uh, let's see, verses 32 through 35. So Psalm 68, verses 1 through 10, and then over to verses 32 through 35. If you'd like to read along with me, that would be fine. 68, Psalm 68, let God rise up his enemies and let them be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, let the wicked perish before God. But let the righteous be joyful. Let them exalt before God. Let them be jubilant with joy. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides upon the clouds. His name is the Lord. Be exalted before him. Father of orphans and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God delivers the desolate, a home to live in. He leads out the pr prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious live in a parched land. O oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked and the heavens poured down rain at the presence of God the God of Sinai, at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Reign in abundance, O God, you showered abroad. You restored your heritage when it languished. Your flock found a dwelling in it. In your goodness, O God, you provided for the needy. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to the Lord. O rider in the heavens, the ancient heavens, listen. He sends out his voice in a mighty voice. Ascribe power to God whose majesty is over Israel and whose power is in the skies. Awesome is God in his sanctuary. The God of Israel, he gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. Will you join with me now in a word of prayer? Most gracious and loving God, we thank you for this opportunity to be together. Bless us as we gather on this Memorial Sunday 
as we continue in this Easter tide uh, feeling and in this Easter tide sense of your resurrection, as we recognize the coming of your spirit in the days ahead, as we recognize in the ascension your bodily resurrection to heaven. In all these things, we find our faith renewed and restored. Help us, gracious God, in this time of remembrance to remember those fallen heroes, those women and men who gave their last full service of devotion to us and to you, Lord, and to the belief in their country and their faith in their God. Praise them and bless them, Lord, even as they rest now from their labors. And for those who uh, sleep in the tranquility and blessedness of peace, those who have moved on from this life to the next, we ask, God, that you would rapture them with your spirit and keep them in your care, even as you would each of us who continue on in our faith journey with you and with others. During this time of worship, may our hearts be open to the revealing of your spirit, and may we find ourselves in a sense of peace, even as we gather in your name. For it is in your name that we do remember and consider the very presence of Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you join me now in the reading and sharing of God's word in Scripture? Today's readings kind of encapsulate and fulfill uh, some of the end thoughts and messages that Jesus conveyed to his disciples. And we also see in these words and in the Gospels, uh, particularly, a sense of the disciples continuing on in the work that Jesus had sent them out to do. As we consider these words, let us consider ourselves as a congregation, whether it be here at the South Parish Congregational Church, or for whatever church group that you belong to and whatever faith you ascribe to. Consider what, it make, what makes that, that faith group uh, special. What is it that makes it special? Join with me now as we begin first reading from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. That's Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. So when they had come together, that is, Jesus' disciples, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set for his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, Jesus was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. A second reading this morning, and I say this morning, but you may be seeing this video in the afternoon or in the evening. That may be one of the values, as I understand somebody pointed out to me, of, of having a recording of a service. You can watch it at any time, but to me, the morning service is the morning service. So if I, I say morning, uh, take it as it is. Our second reading is from First Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14, and then I'll be jumping over a little bit to what, chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of God, which is the Spirit, Spirit of glory, excuse me, which is the Spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, 
under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety upon him, because God cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Certainly appropriate words for this time in which so many of us are under the heavy burden of the virus that is causing so much disruption in our lives and tragically is affecting so many others. Recognize that God is with you in your sufferings. I think these are words that, that Peter would certainly understand or want us to understand in all that we are going through. And finally, our last reading is from John's Gospel, uh, chapter 17, and I'll be ver reading verses 1 through 11. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, The Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given to him, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent, I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made, you know, made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now you know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. And I am asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may, may be one as we are one. May God add his blessing upon the hearing and the reading of these words.
Well, happy Memorial Day weekend to all of you. It seems that this Memorial Weekend is very different than any in my recent memory or in my memory at all. I think of Memorial Weekend as a time of celebration, time in which we kind of herald in the, the summer season, kind of the unofficial beginning of summer. Um, I have wonderful memories of growing up uh, of Memorial Weekend spent with my family, enjoying large uh, meals together, eating a lot of food together, having a lot of fun together, being together, sharing together. A couple of things come to mind, of course, as we think about this, that we are, uh, in a sense, still distance from each other. Even from those whom we love the most, we um, really are in a position where we can't enjoy each other like we usually do. I, my prayer is, is that at least most of us have an opportunity to be with at least some of the people that we love and, and care for so much on this Memorial Weekend. But I would also like to take this opportunity to stop and say that uh, just because we can't gather together in, in fairly large groups, we can still be together. That is not only through this video service or being here during this church service, but also in prayer time, which is something I've mentioned in, in past uh, weeks. Um, but also that there is something very powerful about small groups of people, whether they be our, our families or whether they be a small church family whether they be our, our kind of natural families, our, our home-born families, as my grandfather used to call us, home-born families, people that were so close together and uh, came from the same heritage and same gene pool, so to speak. But also the people who gather in our churches, many of them are a small groups of people. And I'd like to think that we continue to be together, if not only in spirit, as we continue to remember each other's cares and needs and praying for each other, praying certainly for the time that we can be together. There's something very special about small groups of people. And I think the gospel reading, as well as the, the words from Acts, remind us of that. That the first worshipers, the first people that Jesus called, were small groups of people. And that Jesus really relished in opportunities to be with small groups of people, to be able to share with them intimately. So as we come to this time of a, of a message that I'd like to share with you, and as we come first to a moment of prayer, let's think about the small groups of people, whether it be our church families or our, our families that we live with in our homes that we care so much about, and let's lift them up in prayer. Will you pray with me? Most loving and kind God, we give thanks for the people in our lives who are so special. And we thank you for the many ways in which they are special to us. For the many things they do and say to encourage us and to help us. But more than that, Lord, the people that, that are so intimate with us in our lives, that they share virtually all of our lives with us in some way or another. We thank you, God, for those people who uh, care for us and in turn we love and care for so greatly. We thank you for our families and that we can spend time with our families as our prayer this weekend in peace and in harmony. But also, Lord, we thank you for our church families and for the many and diverse people that are a part of those, those groups. Many times, Lord, in this part of the world, in this part of, uh, of Maine, in this, the communities that we share in, churches are small groups of people. Lord, let us never find within small groups of people any lack of, of faith or lack of love. Let us be drawn together intimately, even as we celebrate the very church of Jesus Christ in its many diverse ways. For it's in our Savior's name we pray. Amen. So as we celebrate Memorial Day, I think one of the things that comes to mind is <clears throat> Memorial Day parades. And I would always uh, look forward to seeing that small group of veterans that would would be leading those parades. Unfortunately, we're not going to be having any of those parades, I don't believe, uh, because of the virus that we're all kind of somehow trying to work around and work through. But I always look forward to seeing those small group of, of, of veterans who would come out and march in memory of their fallen comrades and, 
in Narratwalk, we would always gather. It's like in so many communities at memorials uh, in the center of town to uh, remember the, those who have given, as I mentioned, the first full measure, last full measure, I should say, of, of devotion uh, to their country. And it was a time to really remember and to reflect on those, those men and women who had really given so much of themselves, in some cases, all of themselves, to their communities and to the people they loved. It was a small group of veterans that usually would gather and still do uh, at Memorial, on Memorial Day and in, in the Memorial Day parades. And I'm reminded of the, the small groups, but dedicated groups of people who went off to fight and have gone off to fight for our country in so many different wars and continued to serve our country. Small groups of people, women and men, who have made such a difference in the history of our communities and certainly in the history of our country. And the same can be said, of course, biblically speaking, and in our faith as Christians, that it was small groups of people that Jesus initially called. And it was those small groups of people that made up the initial church. And as it grew, it was, an, again, that small group of, of dedicated people who continued to make the church function, even as Jesus had ascended back into heaven. They continued on in his work. So I'd like to kind of highlight small groups of people today. And in particular, I'd like to kind of lift up small churches today. As the South Parish Congregational Church has a history of being a very large uh, church in the past, uh, now we're a relatively small group of people. And we all, of course, as, as members of this church, want to see it grow. But I think we should want to see it grow, grow for the right reasons. The idea that somehow bigger is better is really just not true. And when we think of the very history of our church, and, and when I think of the church, I think of the Christian church, the body of Christ. It's a history of individuals, not really large groups, but of individuals making a difference and making the church become what it has been for these 2,000 plus years. So I'd like to lift up small churches today. Now, sometimes it's a small church, uh, and if you're a member of a large church, I, I like you to think along with me on this if you're watching this. But as a small church, we sometimes get up, get hung up on uh, the idea that we're just too small, that we can't do the things that God would want us to do because we are just too small. But it's interesting to note that in Scripture, God seems very partial to spreading God's Spirit to select, if not small, groups of people. For example, in the book of Numbers, in the Old Testament, the Spirit comes upon 70, 70 elders in the wilderness. An entire nation of people, the Spirit comes upon 70 elders. So to all of them, it, it seems to indwell in this particular group, at least initially. And in the New Testament, of course, Jesus speaks to the individual more often than to the masses and asserting the need for a relationship on a very personal level. That Jesus wants to be on a personal level with us as individuals instead of in a group dynamic. We hear this quote from the, from the Gospels. He, or we could understand that as the individual or as anyone who believes in me, that is in Jesus, as the scripture has said, out of that one's heart will flow rivers of living water. That is God's Spirit. It's the individual in which the Spirit really takes root and grows. It's in small groups of people that that, that, that Spirit is really nurtured and allowed to, to spread and to be spread. In the book of Acts, it points out that God's Spirit initially came to a small gathered group in a small upper room, and initially that, sp that Spirit would eventually spread from there. But it all started in this small group, in this small room, and that's where the Spirit, the very body of Christ, if you will, began to grow. It's in small, dedicated groups of people that the Spirit really comes alive. And we should never belittle that or somehow think that 
being in a small group of believers is somehow less important or less significant than a large group of believers. To the contrary, it seems in the most personal way God touches us when we are, well, as the scriptures describe, two or more gathered. It doesn't say 200 or more or even 100 or more. This is where two or more are gathered. That's where the spirit seems to be nurtured and where it grows the most. Now, as we think about that first group of believers, the first apostles, as we came to know them, um, what made them special? What brought Jesus to kind of draw them in? Well, we don't know exactly, and we can't be very specific in terms of what exactly Jesus was looking for. But what do we know about those first folks? Well, they seem to all either know each other or come to know each other very quickly. They were all within the same area. They were more or less neighbors. Some of them were even family members. Um, what else? They shared jobs. They shared many things in common. They shared many interests. They shared their culture, their society. They shared so much in common that it was easy for them to be drawn together as a group. The early Christian church was a small church. And we know at least initially that Jesus found very, uh, the very personal nature of each one of those individuals knowing each other in some way as a strength to build upon. Now these weren't super intellectual people. These weren't people that somehow stood out within their community as, as um, more articulate or somehow more learned than others. Quite to the contrary. Fishermen and even tax collectors, the dreaded tax collector uh, in, in Matthew, we see them all kind of drawn together. And, and I think the other thing is to be said that even though they shared in the same uh, society, the same culture, uh, you could say in the same kind of neighborhood, that didn't necessarily mean that they all had everything in common. They were very diverse in what they did and very diverse in personality, but they were connected in the same location and connected through their faith and culture, at least eventually in their same faith as Christians. So we know this. this. This is where, you know, Jesus didn't find people, you know, across the globe. He found them in the same area. And we know that he picked out just a varied few of them. Of course, our Lord could have picked out anybody he wanted and as many people as he wanted. But this was a group of people that he chose. The small, diverse, who shared many things in common, but not all things. And this became what became known as the church. And this remained the, the trend under Paul. Small groups of people, as he traveled around the Mediterranean, he gathered them in worship of this, uh, as he put it, known God, this unknown God that became known to them. And he gathered them uh, from shared communities, from shared traditions, from shared interests. He pulled them together as small groups that eventually grew into larger groups, but they were initially small groups of people, small church groups that became what we know as the Christian church. Now, with all of this said, I don't want to discount uh, larger churches, bigger churches as places of worship. God's spirit is not limited in any way. However, there is something special biblically as well as spiritually about intimate, close-knit groups of people sharing in worship. There is something very special about small churches when compared to larger churches. Now, that isn't to say one is better than the other, but it just, it's just, it's need, it needs to be said that because you are a small church, and what I mean by a small church, under 100 people, doesn't make you less important or just as important, rather, uh, in God's eyes than a larger group of people. To the contrary, there are things that small churches can do that larger churches can't do. Now, of course, some things larger churches can do that smaller churches can't do. I think that kind of goes without saying, and I think we all recognize that. But smaller churches have a very special power in their faith. What is that? Well, let me explain it to you this way. Uh, when I was in junior high, I, I played football. Scowagan 
area junior high school, I believe was the full title of the, of the school I attended. Played football, and um, of course, in junior high, none of us are very big. But there was one particular guy who played, and his name, I'll just call him Gary. And he played on my team. And he probably was the best player on the entire team. And what makes this story kind of interesting is this guy weighed probably about 100 pounds. Soaking wet, probably. And it's interesting to note that we never really thought about how small he was because he was so good at playing football. And I remember one occasion there was another a younger guy came on, another new player came to, to the team. Um, and our first thought was, boy, this guy's really small. This new player is so small. But then someone kind of whispered, and they pointed out, you know, he's about the same size as Gary. We really hadn't noticed how small, in a sense, how small Gary was because he was so good at what he did. What made him so good? What made it his size so unnoticeable? Well, I thought about that. I've thought about it over the years, and I think about it a lot of today because I think he shared a lot of things in common with this church, the South Parish Congregational Church, and it being a, a relatively small church gathered. Um, he shared many things, I think, in common with this church that made him a special player and made and makes us a special church. What are some of those uh, attributes? What are some of those qualities? Well, Gary made the most of what he had. At 100 pounds, he could tackle anybody 50 pounds heavier than him and, and play just as well as anybody 50 to 100 pounds heavier in any aspect of the game. Small churches use resources the best. As Gary used his size and all that he had to its best advantage, I believe small churches use their resources to the best and can capitalize on their resources better than probably any group of, of individuals that I've ever met. Uh, that is stretching resources, money, involving all members. Uh, people are willing to step up and take part in services um, that aren't willing to do so in a larger church venue. Um, we make the most in small churches of what we have. And I think that's a great blessing. Gary was a, very much a student of the game as well. Uh, he knew about the tradition of football, and he knew how to play the game very well. And similarly, uh, I think this church and other small churches that I've been involved with, and perhaps the small church that you're involved with, uh, they encompass a very deep Christian tradition in that they recognize their present place in the world. That is, they know that they may be small, but that they're there to make a difference. They don't bank upon their size, upon their wealth. We've never done that, I don't believe, um, here at the South Parish Church. We just do the best we have with what we've got, recognizing that's part of this church's heritage. That's what the Christian tradition is. We are rooted in the Christian tradition. We are history keepers as small churches of the Christian tradition. As I mentioned for those of you who um, served in the armed forces, uh, certainly we salute you today. But more than that, on Memorial Day, I'm reminded of those women and men who went off from their homes, from their small towns to serve their country. And many of them didn't return home. And it's because of their sacrifice, uh, those individuals within each of our communities that really have uh, allowed us to be the individuals we we are, to be the churches we are, to be the country we are. And so as we think about those small groups of men and women that left from each of our towns, certainly not the majority of them, they're the folks that made a difference. Why did they go? Because they, they knew they had some sense that they were part of history. They were part of the tradition of defending their country. And they knew in their heart and in their spirit, this is what they needed to do. Small churches know that as well. We know what we need to do as a part of the history and tradition of each church that we are a part of. We know that each individual counts and that we really can't afford not to have each person take part in that 
There's a need to really ask and reach out to each person as a part of our congregations to take part in different ways, whether it be the sharing of resources or of thoughts and prayers, or whether it be taking part in the various uh, committees, uh, doing the work of the church. We know the value of each person as it relates to the very heart of Christianity, which is the small church. So Gary was a student of the game, and I think each of us as members of small churches understand the importance of being a student of Jesus Christ. Gary worked very well with other people. Despite some disagreements, everyone came to respect him and knew that he was a team player, so to speak. And I think there's very much those same kind of qualities in people who are involved in and engaged in small churches. We need to get along and we recognize that. And we know we're different. And sometimes we argue and we might fight and we have disagreements, but we know that everybody's voice and idea and uh, way of doing things is important and that they need to be heard. Each voice needs to be heard in a small church. And the desire is that each person has a, has a part to play in the church. And again, does that mean we all get along all the time? Of course not. This isn't utopia. It wasn't in Jesus' time and it isn't now. But there's a difference between silencing someone and saying somehow that they're not important because of the disagreements we might have and accepting disagreements as a part of the church community and recognizing that each voice is valuable, just as each person is valuable to our Lord. So we know we need to get along and work together well. And I know here at South Parish Church, we work together so well, as I have in so many of the other churches I've been involved with, whether it be in the Norwich Congregational Church or in the Solon Congregational Church. And I know some of you are watching this video as well. Uh, despite the disagreements we sometimes had, we always worked together so well because we knew we had to and we wanted to. And the desire was to be in the spirit of Jesus Christ, listening and working together. And finally, I think the one attribute that Gary had that was more important than any others, despite his size, is that he never gave up. He was so engaged in what he did, and he never gave up. He had great stamina. And unlike us, I think small churches have great, great stamina. This church has gone through some difficult periods of time here at the South Parish Church here in Augusta. And all the other churches I've been involved with in one way or another have gone through very, very difficult times. Moments when they wondered if they were going to be able to continue to do the good work of our Lord. But somehow, in, in sticking with it and having stick to itiveness, which is what my dad used to, how my dad used to put it, persevering and having dirt determination, small churches survive and they continue to survive and to thrive despite their small size. Because there is an attitude in the spirit. There is a sense of that no one else is going to do this work. We need to do it. We can't pass it on to somebody else. There isn't enough of us. And by the way, frankly, how many people do we need to do our Lord's work? How many people are needed to share care and compassion? How many people are needed to show sympathy and empathy and to do the work of our Lord and to love our neighbors as ourselves? These are all things that individuals can do. Individuals who are part of a church community. You don't have to have 200 people to show love for a person in need. To the contrary, it's more intimate and more thoughtful when we stop as individuals, as small groups, as, as a one person, and show care for somebody than it is for a large group to just, as a group, show care. I'm reminded of uh, my dad when he was sick once at home, and uh, he got letters from some local church communities, uh, large, larger church churches that sent cards that had some signatures on them, and they were nice. But in the local church, the small church, there was a couple individuals who actually came to his house and uh, sat with him and visited him. And he told me that visit by those single individuals meant more than all the letters by signed people that he could ever receive. As nice as they were, to have those individuals show up and show care for him in his time of need. That's what made the difference, and it still makes a difference. And it does involve stamina and 
a willingness to keep going in the midst of, of being tired and worn. Um, but that's what the, the beauty of the small church is. And we can do these things knowing that uh, God has called us to do it. And we dig down as individuals and we find the strength to do this because there's a need to do it. These are all attributes I think my friend Gary had, but I also think they're attributes of the small church that we are a part of. Skillful use of resources, a sense of history and how we are a continuation of that history, a healthy reliance on each other, shared ties within the community, and a sense of purpose that is translated into stamina and longevity. These are the things that make a small church very different and more different than any other community that I know of. Traits that made my little friend Gary a great player and the traits that make this small church and other small churches like this one here in Augusta so special, strong, vibrant, and above all other things, perhaps important. In a time in which the very word of God needs to be shared and not only the word, the very spirit of God shared in individuals' lives and the living of those lives, what could be more important than a group of believers willing to share of themselves in the continuation of our Lord's work? In this church, we pray, like all small churches, we pray that they continue to grow if it's God's will. If it is God's will, and this is so important. But there, because there is a much more important uh, prayer to be prayed. Because it's more important to being a part of Christ's church kingdom and whatever size it might be and whatever size we might be as a congregation uh, than it is to consider the need to be a larger group of believers. That is, uh, being a part of Christ's kingdom is more than just about the size of that, of that group of, of believers. It's about each individual and the difference each person can make within that congregation. This church is doing things now as a community that I dare say were never thought of when it was begun, what, 200 plus years ago. I mean, just as an example, this church here in Augusta, the South Parish Congregational Church, has community suppers each month with dedicated people putting on these suppers for free and volunteering their time freely to do this each and every month. And I know now because of the coronavirus that our church is doing more than one supper uh, a month in response to the needs of others. Uh, this church has a variety or a history of a variety of programs that range in size from uh, small groups of people and recovery pro programs to even larger groups um, in AA programs and, and foster care programs that are going on to even a um, a line dancing group that meets here uh, on a regular basis and extending to the Augusta Symphony Orchestra that calls this beautiful church sanctuary and this church its home. And there are so many other things that I'm probably forgetting. Of course, we have a pet pantry here that serves the needs of individuals who have pets that may be having a difficult time feeding them. These are things that I'm sure that the founders of this church never even dreamed of being a part of within a community, yet we're doing it here like so many other small churches are doing it in their communities as well. One of the questions we all have to ask ourselves as a spot, part of a small church, or really any church, is what part can I play? Because we really can't afford to just be part of the crowd. We need to be involved in some way. And that doesn't mean we have to be involved in every church program or involved on every board of directors or councils or what have you. But each one of us has a role to play. And that role gets highlighted within a small church more than in a large church. You have a part to play here. You have a part to play in your church, wherever you call it home. You are called by God to do that part and to share of yourself. So we lift up today in uh, a sense of prayer, and in a sense of gratitude, small churches and groups of people, small groups of people who have made a difference in the history of our country and the history of our faith. Indeed, this church and other small churches are special places. As Christ said, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I will be. And Christ will be here. And will each of us 
as we gather in his name today and every day. Let's celebrate God's spirit who makes a difference in the lives of individuals and in groups of people who care and call upon his name. Let us pray. Most loving and gracious God, we thank you for this church and other churches that uh, gather and have worked together for so many years, sometimes with large groups of people and sometimes with small. We lift up all those who believe in our Lord and gather in whatever capacity they might gather in. We lift up the name of our Savior in Christian love and in blessedness. But Lord, today particularly we think of this church and other churches where small groups of people gather to worship and out of sincerity and the goodness of their heart and spirit called by the very blessed presence of our God, come together to worship and to share of themselves. Lord, give us each the capacity to give of ourselves in any way that we are called to do so. May we recognize that each voice and thought and need that is expressed within this group of believers, let it be highlighted and lifted up as important and as needed. And as at once as we assume that as soon, as soon as we possibly can that we might gather once more together, let us recognize that it is not the size of the space in which we gather in or in the size of the group that we gather in, that it is we gather only in your name, remembering that where two or more are gathered, where we are gathered in your name, there you are also. May we find strength and grace and love in these words, always in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace, my friends. Uh, recognize God's blessed presence with you today and every day until we meet again. Mm -hmm.